What we're going to be talking about today is really building investment worthy startups with a focus on structure, building a structure. Kindly mute, if you're not already on mute, kindly mute your uh, microphone and please turn off any videos. That way we can conserve bandwidth. In case you don't know, I'm sitting in Lagos, Nigeria and our internet isn't exactly the best. Um, use raise hand to get my attention if you need it. Um, I'll be more than happy to uh, give you some airtime and then mute when done. Who am I? Well, my name is Tommy Davis. I'm not going to read at you. Uh, the key reason I can have this conversation is because over the last 10 years, I've been building a portfolio of early stage tech ventures. And uh, this particular session is born out of, out of that. Um, okay, here we go. So this session, these are the things we're going to cover. We're going to look at some definitions a quick overview of my uh, poem framework, and then we'll, we'll deep dive into how you put structure into your startup. Okay, so I'll give you exactly 60 seconds to read up on these definitions as I use them. What's an angel investor? When I talk about a hub and a startup, please note the definition of startup. It's very, very important. Yeah, I know, uh, techpreneur is a play on the word entrepreneur. Um, and of course, where would we be without venture capital? So, the POEM framework. The POEM framework says simply that for every business vision, there is a POEM that brings it to life. And what is a POEM? Well, we start with the proposition, which is the offer you make to the market, the organization, which is the people, the processes, and the technology that delivers that. The economics is the financial measure of your proposition and organization. And while the milestones are really the steps you take along that journey of bringing your vision to life. Today, we're going to be looking at an aspect of organization, which is the people aspect of organization. And we're going to be talking about how you structure that. Um, noting that an organization actually delivers your value proposition to the customer. That is what the organization is all about. So let's see what we mean when we talk about people. Well, why do people even matter at all? When you look at startup failures, um, for example, we analyzed over 100 of them, and guess what? Not the right team. Having the wrong team to execute was number three. Okay, no market need, ran out of cash, but not having the right, can you imagine not having the right people? That is like trying to win a football match with your mom, your dad, <clears throat> and your uncles and aunts, when they are on the other side, it's your classmates, and you get the picture. So teams are important. It is critical that you be strategic about how you select your team, because there's no way with the wrong team that you can get to where you need to go. With the right team, everything is possible. With the wrong team, no matter how great that idea is, it's not gonna see the light of day. And that is why people who make up teams actually matter. So, where does it start? It actually starts with you, the founder. You've got to really, really, first of all, take a great look at yourself. Self-awareness, is a critical component of success. Without it, you ain't going nowhere, okay? You won't have all the skills you need. It's impossible for any individual to have it. So you have to do a very, very objective self-assessment. And when we're talking about self-assessment, not just the hard skills or I can code or you know I know how to sell, 
Um, we're talking of soft skills to emotional intelligence, the ability to actually read what people are not saying to you. Okay. And you've got to look at what am I really great at? What am I the best person to do? Okay. What am I great at? And at the same time, once you've understood what you're great at, what am I actually rubbish at? My people will tell you, oh, when it comes to TD, you know, he's excellent at speaking and doing a bit, but he's the wrong person. If you're asking him every Monday morning to punch in at eight o'clock, I am not your man for regularity. So it's about knowing yourself. That is what you've got to do. That is where you start. Once you've got that clear understanding of what it is you're bringing to the table, then you're good to go. But if you don't know yourself, or you don't know your strengths, you don't know your weaknesses, then you're not really in the starting gates. However, the good news is, once you do know yourself and you know your strengths and you know your weaknesses, then you're in a position to find competent people to do what you're not good at and do the rest for you. Okay, so what's the first thing after that? Well, design your organization. Yes, I know it's supposed to be a startup. We're not supposed to have structure, daddy, yada, yada. But guess what? You're not building a startup forever. You're trying to build a company that's going to be here 100 years from now. And if you're going to do that, then you've got to structure it from the very beginning, making sure the roles and responsibilities are clear. Okay, that's how you get maximum efficiency. And also you avoid what I call the startup curse where three people are doing exactly the same thing and they don't know it. So before you even look at hiring people, you've got to think through your structure. And you've got to create a structure that's going to enable your team to see their contribution and the impact they are having. Okay, however, having said all of that, also recognize that... Hmm? Could you mute your mic, please? Michael Ogun something. Could you please mute your mic? Okay. Michael Ogundei. Okay. Well, uh, I, I remembered uh, you do have the power to mute everybody. So that's exactly what I just did. All right. Well, some of the common structures we're talking about here. Oh, by the way, sorry, I forgot to add. Um, it's a continuous process. This is not a one-off. You don't just at the beginning of designed it and that's it. This is a continuous process. You've got to be flexible about your organization structure. And you've got to constantly be getting feedback from your team. So that is one of your functions as the founder. Some common structures are put up there, functional, that's your traditional, you know, you report to that person and that person reports to the boss and then you have the boss's boss's boss and it goes on that way. You probably don't want to go in that direction. Divisional is when you have a team that is focused in a particular area and another team that's focused in a different area. These are strategic projects. So for example, if you were doing an agri-tech, you might have, want to have a team that's focused on pre-processing of food, another one that's focused on storage, while one does harvest, that's, that's a divisional. Matrix is when you have you know, both directions, multiple reporting uh, for different purposes, and uh, a flat R key, which is what most startups tend to use, is where everybody reports to the boss. And it, is, it, it just works out that way. Okay, so those are some of the organizational structures you need to think through. Once you've done that, the next thing is to think minimum viability. What are the functions that are necessary to give life to your, to your vision? Okay, what is the minimum you can't do? When you have laid that out, then you can start to think about hiring people. And I'll talk about the kind of people in a second, but the critical thing is this you've got to understand what is the least you can do to get started. That's really, really important at this stage because if you don't, you're going to get what we call bloatware, which is you have more people than you need and then you can run into trouble, especially you know, uh, in terms of money and paying people. But once you've got 
the minimum viable components, then you're ready, you're good to go. What do we mean by good to go? You've got to recruit people who get things done. Executioners, as I call them, okay? Um, you want to build a team that's really, really able to accomplish, not doing talk shop uh, series. People who have the ability to deal with problems quickly and efficiently, uh, who can resourcefully and reliably innovate and come up with creative solutions, okay? Um, you've got to think through what are the potential challenges we are gonna face as a team, okay? We're taking on the new e-learning world. That means, guess what? The education system is really gonna be kicking against us. How do we handle that? What kind of people are we gonna need? That's the kind of thinking you've got to be doing at this stage. And really, you've got to think about people who can be with you the long term. Why is that important? Because again, remember, you are not going to be a startup forever. So you've got to look at people with that lens. Are these people who are capable of getting the, going the distance with you? Okay? Because you've got to plan on building a business that's going to be there forever. I mean, we look at companies like Nokia. Nokia is over 100 years old. They've pivoted from being a paper company to being a telecoms company to now they're a telecom technology company. Those are the kind of people you are looking for, okay? People who can do that without batting an eyelid. Customer centricity. Now, <clears throat> if you don't have team members that understand and look after your customers, guess what's gonna happen? You're not gonna keep your customers. You focus on revenue, you're not gonna keep your customers. However, if you do bring on board people who have an innate focus on customers and are customer centric, you have no trouble meeting your revenue goals. Okay, and that means everybody can get involved in, in anything to do with customers. So that means you've got to ensure that, A, you identify people who have this capability, and more importantly, you make sure you equip them to actually focus on your customers as they come on board. And making sure you keep them too, okay? Next thing that you gotta do is assign roles and responsibilities. Yes, I know, everybody's supposed to be a Swiss Army knife, that's very important, and I'll talk a bit about that uh, later in this session. But you've really got to focus on what are the different departments you're going to need to bring your vision to life, okay? What members must be designated with what responsibility? Don't be vague. Oh, yeah, 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 in charge of marketing. What does that mean? Does that mean I have responsibility for all the key messages, the channels of distribution of the messages, and the customer responses to those messages are those. You've got to be crystal clear on what each person's role and what the responsibility is. Some standard functions um, I put up here, they are not the be all and end all. I just put them up as an indicator of the kind of things you want to consider. Marketing and sales. Who is going to actually get the message out? Who's going to convert the customers? Product design and development. Well, who's that? Last week, I think uh, we talked about uh, product development, so you understand what I mean. Uh, who's responsible for that? And who is accountable for it? Accounting and finance. Money makes the world go around. Who in your team has those responsibilities? Production, operations. The list goes on, but this is an indicative list of what you've got to think through and make sure you understand exactly, okay, how you map that the architecture of your business, whether you're agri-tech, fintech, edutech, meditech, um, or e-commerce, all right, to this uh, particular roles, the particular roles and responsibilities that, um, that you, uh, you need for your business. Of course, bearing in mind that <laughs> you don't need a team member for each and every single function. However, it is good to make sure that you have identified it right from the beginning. Personalities matter. Personalities matter. I am not saying that you have to choose a specific set of personality traits, but 
if you really want to blow up your company, pick people who don't, whose personalities do not agree with each other. You're going to end up firefighting forever. So while no particular personality trait should be a qualifying factor, you need to get to know your team and their traits. Who's the person that never loses their cool? Who's the person that's on a short lease? And really, uh, especially in Nigeria, I know people don't like uh, the whole concept of uh, personality testing. Um, and when we look at where these tests are being used or how they use you, you can see the graph uh, on the right, job skill testing, just about everybody does that. Are you competent for the job? But look at that, less than half the people out there are doing personality or psychological tests. Uh, basic literacy, we just assume that people have it, but as we all know in Nigeria, that's a fundamental one that you've really, really got to look at. What I'm saying here is, make sure you understand who's joining your team personality wise it is a significant part to consider however there are other things you've got to look out for too alignment now you've got to confirm that the person who's applying for the job is actually aspiring for something that is coincidental to where you're trying to go if where they're trying to go to and where your company is trying to get to are not consistent with each other, guess what? They're going to be one of those 50% who are constantly on the lookout for just another job, okay? You've got to confirm that alignment because if you want people who are going to do great work for you in the long haul, you better make sure that their goals are aligned with the job they're doing. And really, if you look at the graph I've put up here on the right, you can see that 97%, that's just about everybody of employees and executives believe lack of alignment in a team impacts the task project outcome. Note the word team there, not individual. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that because you've got to orchestrate the operations as, as the CEO, the founder. Once you know all the individual traits and goals, sorry about that, you can ensure that members work together to create a seamless show. And it really is a CEO, that is what you're doing, okay? You've got to be building team rapport, you've got to make sure they're getting momentum, and it's your job to put the right personalities together. That's, that is the fundamental role you should be playing as the lead. I know this is controversial, but really, you know, you've got to consider agencies. Recruitment agencies have their role to play. I know ah, they're expensive, they're expensive, but guess what? By the time you consider how much time it takes to actually find great people, <laughs> it may well be worth your while to shell out what it is. But you know, if you want to be, if you want to, if you're the DIY kind of person, um, then you might want to use your personal and professional networks. So social networks, LinkedIn is the one I recommend. Um, in fact, uh, as I say here, most recruiters actually do use LinkedIn and um, it's also a great place to find business. So yeah, make sure you do consider it um, and don't discount the fact that they really can help you in finding people. Diversity. Now, here's the thing. Imagine a team where everybody's the same personality, they work the same way, they're driven the same way, they enjoy the same kind of foods, they, you know, they come from the same background. That's what homogeneity is. And it's a walking disaster. It is dangerous. Okay, why is it dangerous? First of all, you're not going to get any kind of creativity out of them, all right? Because they're all thinking alike. Everybody's going to confirm what everybody's doing. The, the thought of actually breaking the mold becomes, you know, very, very unbelievable. And we get into what we call groupthink. Groupthink is what caused the disaster of, I don't know how many of you are aware of what happened with the space shuttle when it blew up that came out of groupthink because all the people on that team 
were just from the same background, you know, and the same environment. And that's really what happens because everybody's going to have the same blind spots. Nobody's going to be there to challenge. But when you have diversity, when you have people who can push back, if you have the right, you know, and I'm, there's no right number. It's just about making sure that there's friction because without friction, you really can't build. It's like we say you need sparks to make fire. It's when you have that, then, okay, you're starting to get yourself into where, you, yes, you are creating innovation uh, that is what you desire for your, um, for, you know, for your startup. Okay. Now, buying. <laughs> this is, how do I put this? Um, I know I say here essential, but it's a bit more than that. Okay. It, it is actually fundamental because you're all, you're trying to get somewhere. If people don't know where that is, they're not going to know what direction to drive in. Just think about it from that perspective. And when you're talking of people, highly talented people who can choose anything they want, that's really what they're trying to figure out it. What is the best use of my time? What is the best use of my life? You know, how do I move in, in, in a particular direction? If you do not have your vision clear, if you haven't defined it and if you can't share it, okay, then the chances that you're going to motivate people on the long haul are slim to zero. But when you have a compelling vision and culture, God, it can make all the difference. Okay. It will make all the difference to getting people on board. So you've got to be sure ab initio right from the beginning that you get buy-in into your vision. My favorite sports. Now, the similarity between sports and business is just very, very uncanny. Okay. This is the first time I'm going to read to you. It says every team member has a role that is their primary concern. Think about it. All right. You're number 11. You're not going to think about defense. You're thinking, how do I attack? How do I shoot? If you're the goalkeeper, you're not going to think about how you dribble. It's how you use your hands. Okay. You're only held accountable for your performance. You're trained to have the agility to switch off your play as the game changes. And you better know the competition. Ah, that then number nine. He likes to run, from, run on the left-hand side. Therefore, you block this way. You never lose sight of your driving force. Okay? Whether it's number five who's keeping the center or it's the number 11 on the left-hand side, whoever's driving, typically the coach. Okay? Now, how does this shape up? How does this affect your particular startup? Well, this is how, it's, how the strategies work. You train your team to do their jobs well, no matter how competent a person is. Okay, no matter how good they are when they're coming, you better make sure you're continuously sharpening the saw to borrow from Stephen Covey. Everybody should be focused on their particular roles. That's why it's important that you define roles and responsibilities. Team rapport is critical. If they are not gelling as a team, forget it. You are absolutely wasting your time. And you have to ensure that your team has the skills and the flexibility to deal with the ever-changing landscape of business. Oh, and by the way, don't lose sight of the competition. I sit on the advisory board of a, of a particular company and I got pitches. I had to respond to, to the pitch saying, unfortunately, I can't, I can't help you because I have a conflict of interest. I already have a company that's doing this. And by the way, uh, for your information, I'm actually going to have to share your information with them because you have the competition. That's how it happens. You never lose sight of the competition. You've got to listen to your team to know what their driving forces are. This way, you know what buttons to push. Remember I said orchestrate? Think of yourself as a coach of a football team. How would you behave? That's your role as CEO. That's your role as the founder. Is to make sure that the team has everything it needs to beat the other team. Because competition is alive and well and living in business. You've probably all heard this one before, but I'm going to reiterate it yet again. Okay. 
you've got to keep evaluating your team, even after they're hired, okay? And then please hire slow, okay? Because a poor fit isn't gonna last, so you're gonna have to start looking again to replace them and all of the costs and time and money that takes, okay? You have to take time in considering the people you're bringing on board. You can easily, easily avoid the time spent looking for other people or correcting them or you know, having to do massive retraining with them by just upfront taking your time to be sure that they do fit the team you're trying to build. And if they don't, we all make mistakes in hiring people. Don't waste time, don't keep them on. Don't, oh, we'll wait till the end of the month. No, pay them off, let them go. It's a waste of your time, okay? As soon as you've discovered, oh no, no, this is not what it's supposed to be, move quickly. All right, because you keep them on, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna spend time and money cleaning up the mess because if they don't fit, they don't fit, that means there's something wrong. And that means they're gonna be doing something wrong, okay? Remember, you've gotta be on top of your game, especially when it comes to individuals that make up your team and how, okay, they are contributing or not to your business objectives. So, what does this all mean? Well, I'm borrowing from my dear friend, Eric Reese, who says, start small, scale fast, after you've thought big. But yes, you do start small. And what do we mean by start small? Well, uh, there's something called a two pizza team test, all right? If your team cannot be fed by two pizzas, then chances are they're too big at the beginning. So you really want to focus on starting small, making sure that you have a cross-functional team. So because the team is small doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to do everything. Everything you describe in your organization structure is what you need your team to be able to do. And you have to pick the right people who have the temerity, the disposition, the customer centricity, you know, and also you have the diversity to ensure, all right, that this team works. Then once you've got it, train them to be smart people, okay? What do we mean by that? Well, let me, let me share what I mean by team smart, all right? Because we're talking about collective intelligence here, which is you've got to have the sensitivity of the members, equality in the distribution of conversational uh, turn-taking. So if one person's always on the airwaves and the others don't spark, chances are you've got disparities in your team. It's got to be even Stevens. Everybody's got to be contributing. The proportion you know, of um, female to male in the group, gender balance is quite important. And then make sure that you have a pro-risk environment. What do we mean by pro-risk? Well, first of all, people feel psychologically comfortable where they are heard and where they're not recriminated unnecessarily. This is what I mean by pro-risk. Your people have to be comfortable enough to make mistakes. Not stupid mistakes, but enough to be able to say, oh, okay, that didn't work. Let's fix it and try again. If you are not building that kind of mentality into your teams, then you're gonna have a challenge down the road. And most importantly, please, 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 all right, measure. Take the team pause. Every team meeting, how are we doing? It's something simple. On a scale of one to five, how are we doing this week? and take it around, but more importantly, make sure you use that feedback to continue to build the team. In conclusion, well, ladies and gentlemen, the right people can set your startup off for success, but by the same token, you get the wrong people, guess what, they're gonna drive you to the ground. Luckily, there are many ways to ensure that that doesn't happen, and I hope the strategies I've shared in this session okay, will help you doing, do that. The quality of the team you bring together is definitely gonna have an impact on your startup. I would like to thank you very, very much for listening. I'm eight minutes over um, because of the unfortunate things that happened. But um, if you have any questions, guess what? Now is the time um, to hear them. So please, 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 uh, if you have a question, raise your hand and, or if you like, you can put them in the chat, but raise your hand and I will uh, be more than happy to take your question. Mr. Izu Chris.
Hello. Please go Good ahead. Morning. morning. Yeah, thank you for your time at the lecture this morning. So I have a couple of questions here. You, when you would mention about the functional um, type of structure, you say we shouldn't go there. So I didn't quite get that. What you no, mean I said it? that's the traditional hierarchy structure. The functional? Yes. So you, would you advise us to practice that? Is that, is that the best practice? No, what, what I'm saying is get cross, get cross functional teams. So you have, you, what you're looking for are people who are just marketing. Okay. okay. You're looking for people who you're not at this, at the very early stage, you're not looking for somebody who says, oh, all I do is marketing. All I do is coding. All I do is X. Oh, okay. okay. You want people who can multi, who can do multiple things. Okay. Because you have a small team and that's how you build. Okay. Sorry. So does that mean that, okay, for example, someone who is in accounting can also be an HR, but that is not in, no, in, in the organizational structure. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just, it's just an example. Maybe in the, in the organizational structure, she, she knows that she, her name is on the two, um, maybe in the marketing or the two posts. So she reports to whoever that is above, above that's, her. That's the challenge. You're thinking traditional and you're trying to fit your traditional thinking into modern thinking. That's the challenge you're having because yeah. just by the language you've expressed, okay, she reports mm -hmm. above her, okay, those are languages of old school. Okay. There's nobody above anybody and that's, that's, that's what we're trying to get across. This is team. This is about mm -hmm. a startup team, okay? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay, you get it. I have another question. Yeah, I get, I get it now. So when you talk about personality, um, I have... I Can have, you type um, that in and I'll answer it because I've got other people with their hands raised, please. All right. All I right. hope you don't right. mind. Right. Please type it into okay, the then. chat and I'll, I'll pick it up um, as we go along. Thank you. Could you mute? Right. right. Next, uh, Raima Amevo. Hello, good morning, Tommy. Good Thank morning. you for your um, presentation. Um, so just following on from the question about the traditional hierarchy and things being more flat, especially at the startup stage. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing that, how do you, um, how do you incorporate accountability within that, you know, if there is kind of, if we're saying that, you know, that there's a structure. Okay, that that's, be... that's why I use the metaphor of the football team. Who's accountable for the game? It's the coach. But if, if the fullback missed a ball, okay, and it was a blinding shot so the goalkeeper couldn't catch it, then we know the fullback is to blame. But if the fullback tried his best and the goalkeeper could have caught it, then it's the goalkeeper. So that's the thinking we're bringing in here. And that's how you need to look at it. It's a team effort. So accountability is about the role and responsibility people have been assigned for that particular period. Does that help? Yes, that does very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Akin Bobola. Hi, good morning. Morning. Um, so my question is, what if you've already made all the like what if i made already made most of the mistakes you mentioned in the beginning how do i adjust what if you made all the mistakes in the beginning yes like um my startup is about uh a year a year plus old but we made the mistake of scaling too fast what i'm trying to say is how do we then how do we then adjust well, the good news is you go back to basics, all right? If you've picked the wrong people on the team, fire them. Find the right people. It sounds trite, but imagine a football team. Again, I love the metaphor of the football, and you'll hear me use the soccer team analogy time and time again, or the basketball team, depending on which is your preferred sport. But if you think about it from the sports uh, centricity, here you are, you've got to semifinals, okay, by having a fantastic center forward, but your defense is always letting goals in. What are you going to do? 
you're going to change the defense. And it's the same thing you need to do. So you've got to critically sit down and look again at all, all your team members and see who's fit for purpose and who isn't, and then take it from there. Does that help? Yes, that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I think I have, right. Uh, the question from Izu Chris, the follow-up question was, how about a situation where someone has a bad personality, but a very good skill at the job? Uh, for me, personality trumps skill any day because skills can be acquired. And that's why you've got to continuously train, okay, your team to acquire skills. You will find that um, the soft skills are critically important. Um, and as for hard skills, they can always be learned. I trust that helps, Mr. Isu. Not, not quite, because uh, I mean, we're talking about engineering skill here, where it was even difficult to get such person at the first place. You can't uh, sacrifice your personality. You can't sacrifice mm. your team for personalities. It's toxic. Right. You're playing for the it's long very, run. Yeah. yeah. No matter how yeah. excellent the engineering is, people trump that any day. So I would, you know, I would caution building a team around a toxic person it just doesn't work yeah. it's difficult yeah. yeah all right thank you all right it looks like Raima has a follow-on question too yes thank you um this question is about something different it's about trying to um build um an export business so if you're exporting from nigeria to the uk um, what are the kind of, I guess, the, the key things that you need to be thinking about um, and the risks around that? Um, because I don't have any experience or expertise in that area, I really couldn't comment. Um, other than speaking generally, uh, I cannot okay. speak specifically to, you know, the export uh, business because it's not something I've done. Um, it's, it's literally that simple. But what I can say in with respect to what we're talking about today is really the people matter, okay? And the more flexible the people are that you have, the easier it is uh, to get things done. And okay. again, Thank you. teams teams drop individuals any day, any day. Teams work better than in, the individuals can. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Going once. Hello, GD. Yes, hi. Hi, Karim Gira here. Mm -hmm. I just asked on the chat. Um, I missed the presentation earlier. I was just wondering. It's a it, the presentation is available, but it will cost you, unfortunately, okay. to get access to. Okay, if you just point me in the right direction, um, I'll yes. make the way. Okay, will do. Thank you. Um, how can I achieve brand reputation with an online training or freelancing platform in Nigeria now that we will see as, now that we will see as genuine? Uh, Jeremiah, I'm not sure I understand your question, now that we will see as genuine. Care to uh, expand, Shay? What are the common mistakes people make when approaching investors? Um, <clears throat> before that, um, let me answer Elijah Omigie. I noticed you didn't speak about startup finance. No, today's session is about building structure. Um, we are following the POEM framework where we talk, we've talked a bit about proposition, um, where we looked at product development. Today's session looks at the organization and we look at putting structure Subsequent sessions, we're going to look at economics, funding, and finance, and we're going to look at milestones. Um, we're going to look at 
minimum viable products and product market fit. I trust that helps. Um, how, do you, how do startups carry out evaluations? Again, that was last week's session, uh, Mr. Elijah Omidye. Um, my apologies for that. Um, right, um, where, what are the common mistakes people make when approaching investors? Investors are always listening for one thing and one thing primarily. That is, how do I get my money back? You spend five minutes with an investor. You spend four minutes talking about your product service offering. You spend the last uh, 60 seconds talking about your team. You do not talk about how the money is going to be made to return the investment you're asking for. That is the biggest mistake I constantly see with people pitching investors or oh, how great my product is, how big the market size is. And this is, you know, um, the, we're going to flip bacon like nobody else has ever done. And we're going to do this. And my team's so great. And we're so fantastic. Um, then you get to the money and you talk about how much you're going to make. You never talk about how the money is going to come back to the investor. That's the primary mistake I see in a lot of the pitches and people talking. I hope that helps. Are you suggesting everyone in the team reports directly to the CEO? At a startup, a small team, the answer is yes. They report to each other as a team. Remember, we talked about the two pizza rule. You're not talking of 50 people here, okay? As you get, as you get larger and as you grow, it, it inherently trickles down into the kind of organization you originally built. And that's why I said at the beginning, You've got to think of those structures, ab initio. But those structures, once you've thought them through, uh, GMC Limited, you're next. Uh, just one second. Once you've thought through the structures, then you start to fit people in there, making sure that these are people whose personal goals are aligned with your vision. And that's how you do that. That is how you grow it. Okay, uh, GMC Limited. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Akin. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to talk about your analogy of comparing the football team with the mm -hmm. business team. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, if the team, if they don't gel together, you should just fire a member of the team. But that No, I didn't say you should just fire a member of the team. I said okay. if you hire the wrong person, okay, then you fire okay. very, very quickly. And the way you do, I mean, uh, I don't know how well you follow soccer, but you'll find that there's some amazing soccer players who don't fit into a team. Then you get rid of them. That's what I'm talking about. Not everybody fits. Yeah, but, but we the focus have is a on team. team rather than individual. That's the message I'm trying to get across. Oh, okay. But I mean, talking about team, we also have a team uh, formation structure whereby the first stage of that formation is the forming. Forming, storming, storming, forming, storming, storming, yes, storming, I'm familiar, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if they are, say, maybe in the storming stage and they, are, they haven't really gelled together yet mm -hmm. and you just feel like, okay, this team is not working, let me just get a fresh team that will gel together, not maybe being patient enough to... That's, that means that you don't together. understand management at all. That would be a naive thing to do, okay? Anybody that would do that would be very naive, because as I said, okay. this is a continuous exercise. That is why, if you remember at the very beginning, I said feedback mm. from the team is how you continuously evolve your organization. Okay. So maybe if we have like a time frame on our... No, it's not about... Team some, some teams can take three weeks. I mean, I, I just did a team uh, about three weeks ago. I was appointed, okay. to, I was appointed to chair uh, a particular committee. That team went through the cycle within 24 hours. Within 48 hours, we had a product report, okay, that everybody signed up to. Okay. Okay, so it depends on what the objectives are and what the vision is. We can't say, oh, teams must be formed within three weeks or teams, some teams don't form till three months. It depends on the objective which you are set. And it depends on how carefully you have selected that team. If you know what you're doing and you understand personality traits and how to put teams together, then you can do what I did three weeks ago very, very easily. But if you don't, okay, 
then you've got mm. to learn these things and understand it. Does that help? Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for You're that. welcome. All right. That was GMC. Okay. Now, if you're, we got six minutes left. So let me see if I can do this very, very quickly. If your startup organically started with a team without setting aside their job descriptions, how do you then rectify this? Um, if you started, if your startup organically, it's the same question. Um, I, what I would do um, is if you're the vision owner, then you know what it is you're trying to build. So it's your responsibility to, to go back to the drawing board and do the roles, uh, roles and responsibilities and then look at who fits into what. And if they do not fit, then you've got to be honest with them and let them know. But that's your responsibility. You are the founder. Okay, thank you for that. You're that welcome. Perfect. Please, thank can you shed more light on the team formation strategy you just talked about? Um, Nathaniel, um, it, there's a traditional methodology for growing for, for that ha we've observed as to how teams, you know, actually form. Okay. Um, and what that is, is it's a process. Okay. Uh, that says the first thing that happens is they, there's forming. And then after the forming, there's storming, there's norming before they get to performing. Okay. So this four stage team bonding process is what we were talking about. I am quite sure if you Google um, forming, storming, norming, performing, uh, you should be able to find uh, lots of information there. Harmony Elua. You had a question? Harmony. Okay, well, how do, you get top, how do you get top talent into your team for less than market rate? For instance, a good programmer who should take home 250K per month and all you can afford is 30K per, per month. Well, unless you've got a compelling vision and you're, and you're prepared to give them shareholding, um, I'm not sure how else you do it. The way I would traditionally do it is, first of all, they've got to be bought into the vision and the vision aligns with where they're trying to go, in which case then they'd be prepared um, to do that, but there's got to be something in it for them. And that is what um, share options were invented to do. So you might want to go Google the history of share options to understand how that is. Um, Hi, Tommy, I joined a bit late. Is it possible to get a copy of the presentation? Yes, unfortunately, my team says you have to pay uh, to get a copy of this uh, presentation. Um, my apologies for that, but if you email Mayowa, I'm quite sure she'd be more than happy uh, to help you. Nancy Jumai Baribo, you're next. Hello? Yeah, yes, I was hi. just wondering, how do we um, avoid um, making mistakes, spending too much in our first year? Of how, do you, how do you avoid what? Spending too much. On what? On, um, so we, we, have a, we want to start a tourism um, business, um, travel and tourism business. Mm -hmm. So we obviously um, have an amount of money that we going to invest into the business. So I was just trying to see how can we avoid spending too much on our first year? Um, that's a very, very broad question um, yeah. in terms of spend. What I, what I would suggest is we've got a session coming up. I don't know if it's, I think it's the week after next or, or three weeks from now. My wife's got the schedule um, where we actually look at uh, the economics. Economics is just like today we've looked at people and how you put structure to people. We'll actually look at uh, money uh, and how you manage it. Everything from cash through to the revenue. Um, and I hope that will help. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next up, Yemi Ogunde. Uh, now, we'll be working on Good morning to everyone. Thank you for the great presentation. Now, my, my question is this, in an existing startup, 
How yeah. do we manage, and um, you discover that there's a, there's a personality clash. Yeah. How do we manage the personality clash among the team? That's my question. Thank you, sir. Um, if you were, if you were uh, here at the beginning, you notice I had said that, you know, the last thing you want is to get personality clashes because invariably somebody has to exit if it's a continuous one. And that is a flaw in your selection process of individuals. Um, that is why I said personalities matter. Because you've got to assess the personalities before they join your team. Because once they've joined and you start having these frictions, you have just one choice and one choice alone. It has been my experience. Somebody has to go. And invariably, that's where value becomes the, the, the critical and when I say value, I don't mean who has the best skills. It's more a question of who has the chance of being with us longest. That is, who can learn better, who can you know, adapt, and who is customer-centric. And there are a whole bunch of things like that that you need to look at to, to make that decision. But you have to do it very, very quickly, or else you know, you'll find that six months later, you've lost a lot of traction because of it. I trust that helps. Oh, Yemi has disappeared. Thank you so much. What kind of challenges can a, can a software as a service startup encounter by growing too fast? What kind? Well, hmm. if you ask us, there, there, there are quite a number of challenges you can, you can have, the most critical being resource. And when I say resource, I don't mean financial resource, I mean human resource. Because the functions, if you're iterating, especially if you're using Agile, okay, what you're going to find is each time you do your function feature assessment, you have more to deliver than you're capable of. And your team can be very, very overwhelmed very easily with that because they'll be coding flat out. And if you're doing split testing in product development, for example, you won't be able to do enough of it. I trust that helps. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if I have not answered your question, please send an email to Mayawa. She's put her name, uh, her email address in the group chat. I would like to thank you all for joining me today. It really has been fascinating hearing your questions, and I hope you have found this session very, very useful. Thank you very much, and God bless.